I offered you a chance to be a cop, and you blew it! You're listening to the Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Rich Outfield. I've seen a ghost. That was weird. I don't believe in ghosts, but I've definitely seen one. And Big Anklevich. Do you believe in ghosts? No. Come with me, and you'll see a world of pure imagination. Oh. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Episode 115. I am Rich Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. And it is still October, right? I hope so. Hopefully we haven't slacked off that much. It wasn't me. It was her. <laughs> it was Natasha. She, she said, said she'd, she'd be, be here. here. It was Natasha. She said she'd be here. Why would she do this? Wait, whoa, announcer man. That's kind of an inside joke for you to be whipping out. I don't think we're ready to share that story with the public yet. That will give us a couple more weeks. I think we'll do it in November. At least. Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. We Do we have a story today? Or we is this have, the episode where we just talk? Well, we'll do an awful lot of that, I'm sure, but we also have a story today. Okay, what is that story? The story goes by the title After School Snacks by K. Bowen Black. All right. Just off the top of your head, give me three or four uh, facts about K. Bowen Black. Okay. K. Bowen Black has been writing speculative fiction and dark fantasy stories, which play out in her head since she can remember knowing how to write. That's one. However, they have lived as handwritten pages in unlined journals and on legal pads for the past 25 years or so. Okay, I I think I'll count that as two. Okay. Realizing that although her mind resided in the Twilight Zone, her body lived in the real world of mortgages and satellite television... BBC America is not free. She pretty much stopped writing when she settled into the uh, nine to five life. She is refocusing on her earlier goal of becoming a writer. She submitted after school snacks to the fifth annual Writer's Digest Popular Fiction Awards under the horror category. The honorable mention she received in the July August 2010 issue gave her the confidence to submit the story to the Dune Steve. And she wants to say thanks to you. And I guess me too, because now she can say she sold her first story. Well, that's cool. That is cool. Who produced today's episode? Today's episode was produced by Scott James Pig. No, seriously, who produced this episode? Just Scott Pig. It was okay. him. Not the whole that middle name thing was trying to make him sound like something he isn't. Wait, maybe he is. I don't know. Thanks, Scott. After School Snacks by K. Bowen Black Old Mrs. Wakefield shuffled out onto her porch as she did every other Friday afternoon at about 3.20 p.m. With both hands, she clasped a round, wide, white ceramic platter piled with freshly baked cookies. They slid, molten chocolate striping the plate as she angled it downward toward a little wooden table near the porch's front railing. She placed an edge on the table, then slid the platter onto the tabletop, watching it eclipse the intricate lotus inlay. She turned, straightened, and squinted at the bright blue innocent sky for a moment, then made her way back into the cool shadows of her home. She soon stepped back onto the porch, carrying a bulbous glass pitcher of pulpy pink lemonade. She let the cold glass, beaded and cloudy with condensation, rest against a floral print dish towel she had folded and placed on her chest to protect her from the chill. Her right hand gripped the handle, and her left hand rested under its base. In this way, she cradled the pitcher to ensure proper support. It would not do for her to drop it. She would not have time to produce another batch. She bent again and slowly set the pitcher next to the platter, laid the towel on the table, then moved to the corner of the porch farthest from the steps. 
She did not bother to uncurl her back as she was about to sit down anyway. She reached the corner and turned around with small steps. She adjusted her body to line up with the rocking chair waiting there for her in the shade of an overhanging oak tree. <sighs> with a slight catch of her breath, as her knees twinged and grated, she carefully lowered herself into the chair. She oh. sighed as she allowed the old firm wood to bear the load of her stringy limbs, a burden which her own bones now carried precariously and with great protest. She sat quietly in the chair for a few moments, then began to rock, humming as she waited. At 3.35 p.m., the school bus eased and squeaked to a halt at the stop two houses down from Mrs. Wakefield's porch. She raised herself slowly and inched to the railing to smile and wave at the bus driver who returned the greeting with a smile and a nod. Then Mrs. Wakefield turned her attention to the group of eight or nine children bounding from the bus. She knew their smiles and gaits, and the shades of their hair and the styles of their clothes. She could recognize any one of them from the back or from a snort of laughter. And they all knew her. The whole neighborhood knew her. The helpful, happy old woman who fixed the children treats and lemonade every other Friday and who could often be called on to babysit in a pinch. She always made sure the child was worn out and sound asleep by the time the parents returned. They ran toward her house before the bus began to pull away with a few unfortunate children on board. They watched the others speeding toward the cookies and lemonade and wished their parents lived a little closer to old Mrs. Wakefield and her nectar, a legend on the playground. The old woman beamed down at the young faces assembled before her gate and scanned the group to see if anyone was missing, if anyone was ill, and discovered a pleasant surprise, an unfamiliar face among the crowd. He stood behind the rest and stared at her in awe from behind a helmet of shiny black hair. When her gaze fell upon him, he dropped his eyes and began to inch away. Mrs. Wakefield smiled even more brightly and called the children to the porch. Come in, come in, <laughs> all of you. The boy looked up to see Mrs. Wakefield smiling and beckoning to him. He moved toward the gate. Come in, I won't bite. The new boy pressed his hands firmly all the way down into the front pockets of his long, boxy jeans his backpack dangling pendulously from his wrist. He moved hesitantly through the gate and up the stairs, toward the porch where the others already huddled around the cookies. What's your name? asked Mrs. Wakefield as the boy climbed the last step. He's Ricky something, said Sally Benson through a mouthful of cookie. Sally was the leader, for she was the first to discover Mrs. Wakefield when the old woman moved into the neighborhood two or three years ago. She was also outspoken and tall for her ten years, and was already developing the swells of breasts. He's new. He moved in two weeks ago. We thought you might like him. The children giggled. <laughs> <laughs> and so I do, said Mrs. Wakefield, whose eyes hadn't moved from Ricky something's face. I certainly do. I like him so much that I have something special for him. She winked at Ricky and scuttled into the house as quickly as her hunched back and spindly legs would allow. She returned a few seconds later, hiding her hands behind her back. She studied Ricky for a little while, pausing to heighten his anticipation. Finally, she brought her hands in front of her and presented the boy with an enormous, magnificent cookie, almost six inches in diameter. The cookie itself was chocolate, its top embedded with chocolate chips in the pattern of a six-pointed star set inside a diamond of chopped nuts and bordered by a ring of marshmallow bits. 
The other children watched enviously as they munched. They remembered that cookie. It had been the best cookie in the world. Actually, they couldn't remember exactly what it had tasted like, but they knew it had been wonderful. Each had received that special introductory treat when he or she first met Mrs. Wakefield. The subsequent cookies, brownies, cakes, and pies didn't have any special designs. But they were always perfect, and the lemonade still tasted so good, it seemed almost magical. The children flocked to that porch every other Friday, like clockwork, like a mini-migration. Ricky's eyes widened at the sight of the cookie. For a few seconds, he seemed shocked and unsure but he soon took it and thanked her. Then, he took a bite. He smiled at her and thanked her again, telling her how great it tasted. He savored the morsel in his mouth, seeming to taste each molecule. Mrs. Wakefield grinned broadly at him, and then poured him a cup of the lemonade. The other children, who had not yet touched the pitcher, quieted. They elbowed each other and turned their eyes toward Ricky. He thanked Mrs. Wakefield again and took a sip. As if the porch lurched, he teetered and had to grab onto the railing for support. The other children giggled conspiratorially as Sally received the pitcher from their host, beginning a frenzy of pouring and gulping and laughing until each had drained a cup. They chattered and pushed and teased as though it were recess with no signs of dizziness or unsteadiness. As Ricky recovered from his initial disorientation, he began to excuse himself. I'm sorry, ma'am, but I should go home now. He backed down the steps slowly, glancing over his shoulder to find his way. My grandmother's waiting. Thanks. It was really good. He felt behind him until his hands found the fence. It was really great, but I gotta go. Thanks a lot. Bye. He was on the sidewalk and moving away quickly. That's all right, Ricky. Come back next time, Friday after next. He picked up speed as he neared the bus stop. Just tell your grandmother you're going to stop at my house. Tell her to call any parent in the neighborhood if she wants to be sure, okay? Okay. Ricky called back, and he disappeared, running around the corner. Mrs. Wakefield gathered the other children around her. They each had drunk two or three cups of lemonade, and their high spirits had subsided. They now moved sluggishly and swayed slightly as they stood before her. He does seem to be a nice boy. Skittish, but polite, she said to blank faces smeared with chocolate and peppered with crumbs. He'll make a nice and necessary addition to the game. And speaking of the game... Mrs. Wakefield opened the door to her house, and the children silently filed inside. They sat cross-legged in a circle around a star pattern made on the carpet with rug deodorant powder, which gave the room a heavy scent of flowers and soap. Behind each child lay a large, plump pillow. Blackout curtains had been drawn against the afternoon sun, so the room was lit only by seven candles, one at each point of the star, and one in the center, where Mrs. Wakefield stood, pulling on a black, hooded cloak. She stretched her arms before her and stared at her hands, which trembled with the effort of her concentration. A small sphere of light about the size of a marble slowly appeared above her cupped palms, almost as dim as one of the candles. It flickered weakly, palpitating like a heart nearing a rest. It expanded slightly with each shudder, but it did not get any brighter. As the orb grew to the size of a fist, Mrs. Wakefield turned toward one of the children, Sally Benson. She stared into Sally's empty, glassy eyes, and the girl's hands moved up from her lap to form a cup in front of her. 
the small pulsing globe floated from the standing hooded figure to the seated one and settled above the bowl made by the child's hands. Almost immediately, the flickering orb gained a rhythm and began to pulse. The glow intensified at the height of each beat until it flared, illuminating the stony blank faces which did not flinch at the sudden burst of light. Sally sighed and fainted, falling backward onto the pillow. Mrs. Wakefield then directed the sphere, now more the size of a cantaloupe, and glowing with enough intensity to sharpen the soft penumbras in the room into hard, definitive shadows. To the next child, whose ready hands had already risen before him to form a cup. Ricky moped through dinner. He pushed his food about his plate and occasionally sucked on his empty fork broodingly as the elderly woman sitting across from him frowned with worry. She had watched the little boy grow more and more reserved as dinner wore on. I've made your favorite for dessert, honey. She forced a smile onto her face, hoping to infect him with some cheer. Turtle brownies, pecans and caramel and chocolate chips. No thanks. I'm not really hungry anyway. The woman put down her fork and knife and balled her hands into anguished fists. Please tell me what's wrong, Richard. The boy raised his eyes from his plate for the first time and looked at the woman across from him. The concern on her face deepened her already prominent wrinkles. He felt the pressure of tears building around his eyes, but did not cry. We have to move again. The woman's mouth dropped open in shock. No. She lives two houses from a bus stop. She feeds weekly on all the easiest kids. She uses a cookie as the inducting wafer and pink lemonade for hypnotic nectar. I didn't know for sure until I tasted them. And she's well established. The kids are building up a tolerance. No. She said again, more quietly, her hunched shoulders drooping even more. He looked down at his plate again. I think she pretends it's magic. Her wafers have some star pattern on them. Probably has a whole ritual. The woman lowered her eyes as well. They sat quietly for a long while, hearing the buzz of silence left by astonishment. How old is she? I don't know. Maybe about our age. Three, four hundred years. But she keeps her body pretty old so she doesn't need much energy to maintain it. A couple of children are only a bit too tall for their ages. Nobody's noticed. Then couldn't we just share? You could bring different playmates home. We don't have to use the same ones. Hers are the easiest to control! The little boy shouted and banged his small fists on the table. He rose and began to pace, his frustration cutting through to the surface. He soon caught himself and stopped. He took one deep breath, let it out, paused, and continued with renewed calm. That's why I hung out with them all day after school. He walked around the dinner table to where she still sat. Her hands had long unclenched and her forearms were now crossed and rested heavily on the table before her frilled place setting. She stared down at it, remembering that she'd picked it because she assumed an old lady would like it. She'd always hated it. Richard took her hands in his, feeling his moist, plump skin close around her papery, spotted fingers. Although she sat and he stood, they looked straight into each other's eyes. We have to be realistic. Even if I could find another good group, three of us can't feed on one neighborhood. You get 20 11-year-olds with bass voices and menstrual cycles, and the parents realize it's just the kid who visit her and us. We can't get sloppy. We haven't been burned out of a house for decades. He paused and sighed. Penny, we have to move. Tears gave her eyes a feverish sheen. She sat still and focused on the throbbing radiance of youth penetrating her hands from his. Where their hands touched, her joints loosened and her tendons relaxed. She reluctantly pulled her hands away. 
Pressing her palms against the table, she rose cautiously from her chair and shuffled to the dining room. Her knees objected to every step. The window looked out onto the street in front of the house. They always left these curtains open until dark so everyone could see in. Everyone could see that there was nothing to fear from the old woman and her grandson having dinner, discussing homework and television and chores and feeding grounds. After dark, they could close the curtains and, well, what the neighbors did not know would not hurt them. Not much. It was not dark yet, but she pulled the cord and the curtains rattled closed. Hold me. He went to her and again took her by the hand. She led him upstairs to their bedroom. He drew the blinds and she turned out the lights. Silently, they removed their clothes and faced each other at the foot of the bed. A crone and a cherub, standing naked and breathing deeply with concentration. Richard cupped his hands before him, and soon a small sphere of light glowed brightly above his palms. It grew more and more radiant and expansive as his bones and muscles elongated and the round, ruddy face of a nine-year-old became angular and oval. Soon, he no longer had to look up into the eyes of his wife. The blazing orb was now wider than Penny's body, and she had to open her arms to accept it. Her stooped back straightened and wrinkles smoothed themselves from her face like final ripples easing across the surface of a pond, leaving stillness. The sphere quickly dimmed and began a silent sputtering death above her cupped palms until it dissipated altogether. Where a little boy and an old woman had stood moments before, there was now a couple in their forties, embracing and crying. After they made love, they lay together, cradling each other and trying not to think about the preparations they would have to start making in the morning. As they drifted to sleep, he hugged her tightly against him, pressed his lips to her neck and whispered to her. It really is a shame. Hmm? She sighed, wriggling her body against his and balling herself up tighter as an invitation for him to curl tighter around her. His body answered the invitation automatically. She felt his lips curve into a smile. Her wafers are all right, but nobody makes nectar like you do. Author's Note over the years, I've encountered several different people who boasted that their homes were the hangout places for their friends, families, and neighbors, and for their grown-up children who had moved out but kept stopping by unannounced. They'd say that they always had food cooking or had something baking, or they had a stocked bar or a big screen TV, or something that attracted people to that house. But these same people complained about how much time it took to cook or how they were constantly being eaten out of house and home or how they never had time to themselves or privacy because people were always stopping over. And when I asked why they put up with it, they would say, oh, it's family or I do, but they just come over anyway. These answers made me very suspicious and I wondered what they were getting out of these visits. I decided that no matter the inconvenience, it was worth it to them, because, like all of us, they fed off of something that their guests bought into the house. They might not be sucking the pure life force out of their friends and family, but they were probably slurping up some camaraderie and goodwill, love, maybe even a pinch of envy about that big screen TV. So After School Snacks was inspired by those people who never say no to these inconvenient guests and, in fact, set out bait to attract them 
because the toil and the nuisance are the price they are willing to pay for whatever it is they consume from their company. So I just want to end by saying that if you are one of those people who like to just drop by, just be aware that you may be paying for that free food or free booze in ways you did not intend or do not understand. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Hope you enjoyed the story. Thank you, Scott, for producing. Thank you, Little Boy Black, for... Give me the name again. <laughs> K. Bowen Black. I'm sorry. I'm away from the uh, computer or... You're sitting sideways I'm to it. I'm away from my brain. Yes. <laughs> so you cannot read that it's right there. K. Bowen Black. Little Boy Black was the uh, name of the band you gave to your one story, right? Okay. Bonus points if you can remember what it originally was. Oh, I can until remember. Until I found out there actually was a band <laughs> called... The band was called Semi Colon Cancer. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I remember that story from way back when. Did, did we ever use that on the show? I know we've had people do it as uh, an audition, audition piece. I don't no, think we I actually. I don't think we've ever. It, you know that that reminds me though. Just this week, I discovered on YouTube one of your stories <laughs> uh, in audio. And Scott, this Scott that did after school snacks, he auditioned for us way back. I don't know how long ago it was. Before he did Welp. Right. He auditioned to be a producer. And and what we usually do is we'll send out one of our short stories to have people record, do the voices of, and then, you know, if they want to do sound effects or music. Right? Isn't that what we do? It's mm-hmm. been so long since somebody's done it. But that's what we used yeah, to do. Yeah, that's what we usually do. You sent him a short story of yours called Breaking and Entering. Mm-hmm. And instead of reading it himself... He wanted us to do to read it, and then he was going to edit it. What was there a reason? Uh, I think it was just because he wanted to produce rather than be a narrator or whatever. I guess I'm not sure. You know, it's been such a long time that I don't recall. But yeah, we read it instead of him, and uh, he edited it up for us and put sound effects and whatnot on it. And sent it back to us as his audition to be a producer. And we thought it, looked, it was great. So we went ahead and assigned him? hired him. Commi- right. Yes. A, 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 well, it wasn't assigned because what you do is you send him three or four stories and say, pick one of these to produce. It depends. Sometimes right? I do that. Other times I just assign. Oh, okay. It just depends on uh, what the deal is at the time. So Welp was the first. No, no, st- no, no. Not Welp. Welp. <laughs> Yeah, I never get tired of that. <laughs> uh, that was the first story he produced for us, and now he's producing After School Snacks. So once again, he just produced it and edited it, but he didn't narrate. He didn't do a voice. Is Has he ever given a reason for not wanting? Is it just he doesn't feel like doing that? That's not his strong suit? He would rather take a step back and be a you know a director rather than a director slash actor? Uh, I think it's just because he feels that he can't live up to the great rich outfield. So, well, as flattering as <laughs> that is, I know you're joking. No, yeah, he's never given me a reason. I don't think it, it, there may have been one in an email six months ago, but if there is, I don't remember. But I get, I would guess that it's just not his thing. Okay, well, hey, let's talk about this for a second. Okay, every once in a while, we will have somebody who says. You know, I'd like to do something for the show. I'd like to do a voice. I'd like to, but do not use my real name. You know, make up a new name for me or call me Chuckles McBigglesworth or whatever they say. And, I, you know, I've always wondered, is it that you don't want anybody to know that you did this? Is, is this a shameful <laughs> act? You know where I'm going with this. So, to be so. associated with the great Rish Outfield is sometimes considered a shameful act. Oh, yes. Every prom date I ever had, believe you me, they, there's a reason they didn't want to take the pictures. <laughs> but, you know, from the very beginning of our show, I remember you lived in fear. Not mortal terror, but like a constant nervousness that this podcast would somehow get you in trouble, that this would come back to bite you in some way. Probably in relation to your job yeah that's kind of the main thing that i worried about i guess wait wait, wait. worried past tense 
I guess I still kind of worry about it because I still have the job and I, you never know what's going to happen. You know, it's it's funny because uh, we've been doing the show more than three years, right? We're like three years and several months into this thing. And no one ever wanted to know anything about the show at work at all. Well, you work with announcer, man. You worked with the voice of Natasha. Not Natasha. But <laughs> she you, said she'd be here. I'm sorry. That was, that wasn't really Freudian because I don't want to have sex with Natasha. Because that was all Freudian stuff, right? Is is you the actually want to have sex with? I think Sigmund Freud is what that says. <laughs> I think the Freudian slip is just what you're actually thinking slips out. Okay, so like the Countess worked with you, mm -hmm. and some of those very early voices yeah. worked with you. And I remember, yeah, there was nervousness because, well, geez, I, I, I guess we're tiptoeing here. Can you tell me your feelings? Well, I was just afraid that something could happen that would get me in trouble and they'd decide, oh, yeah, well, that's just not okay and now you're fired, which would be really bad. Or, I mean, it's conceivable that they could say either you stop doing this podcast thing, which is making trouble for us or for you or made somebody uncomfortable that you worked with, or – you know, you'll have to look for another job, right? Right, I mean, it's, yeah. That's, is that beyond the level of possibility or? I don't know what the level of possibility is. You never know what could happen, which is why I try to keep it on the down low. But yeah, strangely, after three years of doing this, this show, like last week, I've had three different people that I work with ask to find out wh what the deal is with this thing and they want to check it out and listen to it. And and are you hesitant to tell I them? Am, I am a little hesitant to tell you the truth. I, I tell them to uh, keep it on the down low as well <laughs> just because I don't know what could happen. I don't think that anything could really, but you never know. I don't know. I mean, it seems like they can find reasons. No, I totally understand that. And I know as much, if not more than anybody, <laughs> of how something that you do on the side can come back and bite you or, you know, get you in trouble. Last week I was talking about that college, that, that university professor, uh, the writing teacher, and how he would always say, this is how things should be done. And, and, that, and, and he was a published writer. And so he would always talk about from a, a position of authority, from a position of experience, right. this is how an editor will look at your piece. And, this is, and yet he would always preface these conversations with, my works are not available in the university library. Do not, please do not go out and seek out my works and read through them and find something to get offended about. And, and, and please do not read something, get offended, and then attempt to get me fired because of that. And we live in a society in America here where there's a great deal of tiptoeing that goes on. And there was a, a, a professor that was fired that year that we went to school because of something that he said and, you know, a student took issue with it and decided, as people sometimes do, to protect the rest of our sensitive ears by getting this guy fired. And so I guess there, there was that. But I always felt like the guy was a coward, <laughs> that he didn't want anybody to read his book and say, you know what? This sucked. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> right. And that's why the book wasn't in the library. I mean, I know that has nothing to do with it. wasn't in the library because it never made the list of books worth buying for the library, <laughs> not because of any offensive but nature. As far as I know, he wrote it under his real name. And I guess you could have used a pseudonym and saved yourself all that stuff, except for what happens when somebody finds out that you're actually this pseudonym and does the exact same thing? It's right. like, oh, let me bring it to his employer's attention that he actually writes erotica on the side under this <laughs> other name. And you know what? In a perfect world, in a free society, that shouldn't matter. But it does. Constantly you'll read about, and you, you're much closer to the news than I am. You'll always hear about a teacher that gets fired because of something they, they posted on Facebook or a student that gets in trouble because of something they put in their blog, you know, that kind of thing. Right. We've become a society where every amount of information is at hand. And because it's so accessible, we consider it all relevant too. You know, it's just like in sixth grade, he said, you know, I effing hate my teacher. So as an adult, he shouldn't be allowed to be around students. I, you know, influence students, things like that. They're leaps that people make, but they're made all the time. 
Yeah, and so I can see people saying, you know, I I don't want my voice out there. I don't want my name out there. Mm -hmm. Back when we first started this show in the first place, uh, we did a news story at work about a woman who had a blog and her blog got bazillion hits and she lived like a king all from the ad money that she got from her blog because everybody in America reads this blog apparently. Uh, hey, folks, uh, let me interrupt just for a second. I mean, because hey, like you right, have a choice. I was right in the middle of saying something. Jeez. You're always in the middle of saying something. Uh, this is our second go through on this episode. There was a horrible, horrible sound pretty much throughout the first pass of the episode. It kicked in immediately and then it was silent for about 15 minutes and then it just started going. Nyeh, nyeh. It was like Gilbert Gottfried. Uh, nearing climax, we'll that put that a, PG-13 on there. That puts a great thought in my head. Thank you. I'll give you a moment to finish. Anyhow, so we're, we've, we had to re-record the episode, and we will do whatever we can to make this one more efficient, uh, less inspired, slightly less offensive, and it won't be funnier, will it? No. It's never funnier. It's never funny to begin with, for that matter, but... How dare you, sir? How dare you, sir? <laughs> so I was saying something, right? Before yeah, you so rudely interrupted me. What were you saying? I think I was talking about that woman who had a blog. Well, we'll say it again. White boy. <clears throat> <laughs> uh, yeah, there's this woman who had a blog, and her blog was one of the first blogs back when blogs were just being invented, I guess. And they still called them weblogs or something. I don't know. She was also, unfortunately, one of the first people to get fired for what she said on her blog. She blogged about people at work and things like that. Oh, and it got back to her work. It did, yeah. It came back to her work. People who were being talked about saw these things on the internet and they went and complained and... Uh, she wound up getting fired for uh, writing about this stuff uh, on her blog and publishing it out there for the world to see. I guess she never considered that it might possibly make it back to the people that she was talking about, you know? I mean, right, but early on, I, I don't think anybody would consider that. Yeah, you wouldn't like, think so. It was such an anonymous, you know, there was a bazillion sites on the internet and... There's so much porn out there. Why would anybody read my blog? Seriously. Totally. In the end, though, she was the one that wins because her blog has become so popular. She talked about getting fired from her job on her blog, and she got media attention, like, you know, your, your old-school media, like television and newspaper and stuff like that, were talking about her because of the whole getting fired for what she said online thing. And, uh, yeah, her blog became really famous, and she's got a bazillion readers, like I was saying, everyone in America reads her blog. and she, It's yeah, the law. It is. And she makes a crap load of money. And that was one of the things where I thought, gosh, you know, if she can do something like that just with a blog, she makes like my annual salary in a month just from the ads that people will put on her blog because so many people come and read it every day. And I just thought, gosh, maybe I ought to... Uh, Give it a shot. Why am I still sitting around here saying, yeah, I could do a podcast. Maybe I could do a podcast. Instead, I let's do it. So we're partly here right now because of her, because of this woman. Right. It kind of inspired me to take it from dreaming to reality. Okay, well, well we didn't start our show then, though. I mean, it was a long time after that we finally did the podcast. But I'd had the idea of doing it for a while. Oh, okay. I have always done, uh, since well before we started the podcast, I did that kind of stuff for a living. I did production work. And uh, when you first, I think you were the one that first introduced me to Escape Pod and some of the other podcasts that are out there, I started listening to them and I thought, gosh, man, I would love to do something like this. And I could do it. I knew I could. I just had to figure out because... You just had to put one foot in front <laughs> of the other. That's it, Rish. Singing again. That's my cue to leave. All right. Okay. Thanks, announcer man. You got us back on track. Um, mm -hmm. If we had actually started the podcast when you first came up with the idea of, hey, let's do a podcast, would we still be doing the show today? <laughs> I don't know. That's uh, 
because that probably we probably would have started maybe even two full years before we did uh at least a year and a half early i don't know will we be doing this in a year and a half i wouldn't have thought that we'd still be doing it now sometimes um there's been many a times where i just like why in the hell are we doing this it's not worth it and do do you ever say why would we do this natasha she said she'd be here i don't understand why would she do this but <laughs> back then, when I originally thought of it, that was before there was a Drabblecast, before there was a clone pod, before Starship Sofa did stories. They just had two guys that sat around and talked about stories instead of actually running their own stories. I mean, it was back when doing stories on a podcast was still a really new novel idea. There wasn't even a pod castle, you know, there was still just Pseudopod and Escape Pod. Who knows what it would have been like. Are you uh, saying that we could have ruled the world? Before? We could have. It's like What's-Her-Face's blog. You know, she got in when blogs were new. I don't know. Maybe there's 10 blogs that you could choose from in the world, and that's why everybody in America reads it now. I don't know. I mean, it could have been the same for us. Maybe everybody in America would listen to us because we would have started before everybody else i don't know well you know me you know that that one of my favorite sci-fi concepts is the the idea of the parallel universe there is another universe where you turned left instead Uh of right and your whole life changed just from turning left we will never know how different the show would be or or we would be or, or whether it would rain donuts in a world where you started the podcast where and you first wanted to start a podcast wow i want to go back to that rain donuts that's uh sounds like something that would be worth turning left for oh i i agree i i like donuts i like donuts more than chalupas oh my goodness i love chalupas it doesn't get any better than this you know it's possible that scott get satisfaction just from sitting back and, and, you know, calling the shots and editing and doing all the behind the scenes things. But, you know, me, I, I'll take any part I can. You know, I'll take all the parts. I don't care if nobody else has a part because, you know, I just want to be loved. Is that so wrong? You are pitiful. There are people that are like you that want the spotlight. And there's those other people that just are happy to be the extra or the background person the the chorus and then there's people that want to be behind the spotlight the ones that move the spotlight around and make it shine on the rich outfield who's dancing and capering and asking for everybody to look at him and love him look at me damien and yeah and there's even some people that don't want any lights on they want to be the ones in the audience that are sitting there watching the people put on the show It was kind of hard for me way back when we first started to be the guy that's in the spotlight. It wasn't something that I was necessarily comfortable with. I mean, we've talked before on the show about how bad of an actor I was when we were in college and we did student films. Yeah, I got nothing but ridicule for anything that I did because I was terrible. You know, it took me a lot of getting used to and a lot of working on it to actually become the great on microphone talent that i am today baby (laughs) because yeah it wasn't something that i was necessarily comfortable with but i've noticed as time has gone by we've been doing this what three and a half years almost and i've noticed a, a big difference even in my regular old personality every day from what it used to be because i've been able to put myself out there using this show and i've been able to become a more outgoing kind of a person at least on the microphone and it's bleeding over into even regular life where you know i'm not so afraid when i'm in a social situation or whatever to call attention to myself or whatever i'm I'm, but you know it's it's taken a while and not everybody's that way Uh, my wife for example i remember when we first started the show we had her do a lot of voices and Oh, she hated it. She she did it. But you could tell just looking at her as she did it that she was not having a good time. And, uh, yeah, she just really didn't enjoy it. And she didn't want to be in front of that mic. Well, your kid's that way, too. Your son is like that. Yeah. He's a little different. He's not so much that he doesn't want to. He's just not cut out for it, you know. He's got, like, stage fright or something. You know, you put him in front of a mic, and he can't manage to get that line out 
without stuttering or, or, or whatever. You know, he's got to stop in the middle. And, and then there's my daughters who are crazy. Like, yeah, your youngest daughter, you know, she sees us here and she's like, I want to do a line of coke. <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry. She says, I want to perform. I want I, I want my turn. She's crazy that way. And, and uh, my other daughter, who's really good and can get her to say it and you can get her to change it around and heck we got her to learn a song that one time that we freaking cool, made yeah. up for that show so it just depends i think a little on the kind of person you are and and what uh, you might be drawn to i don't know maybe scott's like that maybe he's just biding his time and waiting to wow us well hey it's it's fine either way Scott's got a, a unique way of doing things. He's always got like an unusual perspective or, or take on how to do this stuff. You know, he might have a job where he works with audio or, or stuff like that. You know, he might be an engineer or something like that in real life. For example, uh, like Rich Girardi on the side is a uh, he's a master of puppets. A master of puppets? Wait, wait, haven't you ever heard that <laughs> song by uh, Megadeth? Oh, that was the unkindest cut of all, Rish. I, I think in, in real life they call those people puppeteers. Oh, okay. Well, that, that's fine. But I'm, all I'm saying is that some of these people might be paid to do something sort of similar to what they do. Like you're paid to be an editor in real life, and that makes you do the show better and, and faster, stronger, more, more. more powerful, yes. As long as I've known you. You've done that. I mean, I, when we first met in school, you already were the guy that they'd say, oh, he can put reverb on your voice or, or, or stuff like that. <laughs> you know, someday people are going to see your work instead of just hear it if you ever get that damn Transformers movie done. Oh, uh, that'll be my chance to wow them. I've just been biding my time. <laughs> Indeed. And, and you know what? Two episodes ago, the, the Tobias episode, that guy, Tobias Queen, he directed... He read the story. He did the sound effects, as far as I know. He produced it, obviously. He did the music. He did the episode art. He did the babbling. Wait, wait. Did we ever find out how he did that? No, that's the thing. I'm one of those people who wants to know how the trick is done, you know? So some people are fine to watch. I like to watch. But I like knowing, you know? It's like that Attack the Block conversation we had the other day. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't remember that. <laughs> Do you honestly not remember it? Tell me about it. <laughs> Maybe it was a that gets my goat. The, the, the oh, Lone well, Ranger. Then nobody one. remembers it. Okay, well, I will say. Nobody listens to the, that. <laughs> the Attack the Block was this British horror science fiction film, and they had no money. The, so they had to make these aliens on the cheap. Practically? Practically, but at the same time, they used their imaginations, and so they created these really, really cool looking aliens. That to me were more impressive than if they had spent fifty million dollars on the darn aliens, because you you know I, I say it all the time and I, I hate to repeat myself but I'm going to you could see that they were actually in the room and when they leaped on somebody something actually jumped on that person you know what I mean but I'm one of those people that when I saw that it's like how did they do that how how did they pull that off you know some people are okay to just go to the movie. And they say, well, somehow they recorded somebody's dreams and in Inception, and that's what we're seeing. You know, they just put those electrodes <laughs> on their head. Okay, you rolling? They're fine like that. And I'm not criticizing people that are like that. You know, we, uh, years ago on the show, I talked about when I was a little kid seeing Star Wars and, and, and just believing that Chewbacca was real, that there really were Wookiees. And, you know, I've heard that kids in 1989, when they saw Back to the Future 2, thought that there actually were hoverboards. And they're like, Mommy, I want a hoverboard for Christmas and so I can rape. And, you know, I just, it was... <laughs> Wait, what? And, you know, they didn't realize that it was just a special effect in the movie. I, I guess I was a little too old when Back to the Future 2 came out. They so. had uh, a, a big run at the stores on that, though, because short-sighted retailers did not order enough hoverboards to meet demand. <laughs> You know, it's funny because uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if it was last year or the year before, but my daughter, we were asking her what she wanted for her birthday. Sometimes she'll just, I mean, kids do that where they just spit just the weirdest crap out. And you're like, what? The, where did that come well, from? Well, you might want to take her to a doctor. <laughs> what, what kind of spit are we talking about? And so we asked her what she wanted. She's like, you know what I want for my birthday? I want a clean bot. Like what? <laughs> she's like, that like a know. like a Roomba or something? No, like she wanted a, a robot that cleans and cooks and does your chores and cleans up your room. 
and also one that does your homework and stuff like that too. And she's like, I, I don't care if it's an old robot and it doesn't have to be pretty a robot either. It can be an ugly robot. It just needs to do my chores. And we're all like, okay. I think she's watched a little too many cartoons or something because, yeah, she's like those kids that uh, are all like, hey, I want a hoverboard for Christmas when it doesn't quite exist. They had to wait till what what year was it, 2005? 2015. <laughs> oh, oh, they're coming up then. Too bad Steve Jobs died because he probably would have invented that by 2015. <laughs> There's an app for that. <laughs> hey, uh, RO8OT, do you do bedrooms? Um, that costs extra. What do you mean? And also, no kissing on the mouth. <laughs> That's pretty good, actually. Holy, holy I think he's reverting to his old programming. What the heck? You know, that, that whole kissing thing is a deal breaker for me. <laughs> okay, so uh, this was the author's first sale, right? Yeah. Well, th- she totally sent this story to the right place. I mean, because... It has an evil old woman in it, right? <laughs> it has malevolent children. It has like magical shape shifting. It's like she saw me walking down the street <laughs> and she recognized that, oh, there's an easy mark. Look right there. And, and so the pickpockets or the grifters or the homeless people, you know, just they, they zero in and go after me. That's that it, the story was for me. Right. It's it like- was designed to appeal to me. You know, maybe she's a listener of the show and she knows what really rings my bell or, or, or right. pulls my... Not which... which... Exactly, okay. I, wait, have you ever done an old woman, like, before you got married? No, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> have you ever done an old woman voice on the show or do I always hug those? I don't know. I think... Don't know. I've done several old men, mm, okay. but I don't know if I've ever done an old one. I have that go-to old man voice that I always try and do, and I've used that one several times. And yeah, my only caveat was mTOR that we had a a story kind of like it. You guys did an episode while I was gone that it, it had something similar going on, body switching or. Re- taking the form of somebody else and i can't can't remember what it was called because you know i was in the oh oh that's right yeah i remember when you're in the phantoms yeah that story was called becoming brother and and it had similarities with this right yeah it was somewhat similar i mean had a a kid was a uh, one of the lead characters and there was a kind of a witchy mom that was doing stuff that <laughs> see i'm now i'm all paranoid we're starting to repeat ourselves it's kind of like when stephen king writes a second book about a mysterious car supernatural car yeah, kind haunted of thing. car didn't he say that he was going to retire because he was repeating himself he kind of uh, didn't no i think he said the day that he re- starts to repeat himself he knows that it's time to retire <laughs> but didn't he say he was going to retire like didn't he announce that like 10 years ago And he's like, I'm going to retire, and so quick, I'm going to finish the Dark Tower series, and then I'll just go to a beach and hang out. Oh, while I'm at the beach, maybe I'll write a story about Duma Key. Uh, Well, this isn't really a writing episode, but can you retire? Can you stop writing? If if that's what you do, if that's what you love, do you reach a day when suddenly you're like, F it, never again. (laughs) It's like, okay, you're a gigolo, right? You're a sex worker. And nine to five, day in, day out, you perform and make lonely housewives less lonely. And then one day you're just like, nope, never again. I've had enough. I don't know. I maybe maybe you're you get to menopause and oh, and things change. It doesn't work out the way you, it used to. I don't know. I guess a gigolo probably doesn't get to menopause, but yeah, I, I don't know how we got off on this tangent. Yeah, should I mean, that be? Should... Uh, listen, the reason we got off on this tangent is because announcer man left the room. Announcer man, announcer man left the room. All right, OT, would you cut out all the stuff about the gigolo and? Sorry, that costs extra. All right, well, it's at least he's got something to add to the show. Wow, when did that happen? He must be, like, saving up for something, or right? He keeps asking for more money. What's the deal? Uh, so, it's October now. We're running this story in October. It's not really set at Halloween time, but it's kind of similar to, like, a bunch of kids coming to an old lady's house and, and trick-or-treating and stuff. There's that whole... I don't I want to say it's an urban legend or something about people putting razor blades in apples and then giving them to kids 
at uh, Halloween time. And I don't know if there was ever... I've heard somebody say that that crap is, is all urban legend. It's something that never actually happened. But people started saying, oh, yeah, there was an old lady once who did this. And then there was a bloody hook on the handle. And... The old man that handed out little baggies of his chunder. <laughs> there was, you know, the poison candy and the apples with the razor blades and the, I don't know, the... x lax and something in brownies or something. I, I can't yeah, remember. Yeah, all that kind of stuff. Now it's it's basically taken as, as canon. It's like believed. It's real. There's people out there that are trying to do that. They want to poison your children. So now you have to go through every bit of candy and check and make sure. Oh, is the little corner of that wrapper turned outwards? maybe we better throw that one away and you know you can't accept something that some old lady has lovingly crafted for you she made a wonderful wafer for you with a pentacle in nuts on the top or something like you can't you can't accept that from the lady when you go trick-or-treating it's just and and you as a what is the opposite of a trick or treat or the person that gives out candy? And you as the candy giver can't give out like caramel apples right. or popcorn or condoms mm. or <laughs> right. cookies that you made yourself, right? Yeah, it's not allowed. Yeah, condoms that you filled yourself. <laughs> yeah, you can't give that stuff out. Um, it was weird. Like I'd say it was two years ago or something. We were trick or treating. It was in our friend's neighborhood, actually. We weren't even in our own neighborhood, so maybe we should have been more careful. <laughs> but <laughs> we went trick-or-treating, and at one house, I think they were having a Halloween party inside, and they had a bunch of people there and stuff, and, and as trick-or-treaters came to the house, they had a big cooler, or I guess it would be a thermos? <laughs> it's not a cooler, because they were serving hot chocolate out of it. A cauldron. <laughs> yes, they had a cauldron of hot chocolate. And they were giving each kid, as they came up and got their candy, they would also give them a cup of hot chocolate to take with them. And it was, you know, it's around here it gets cold at Halloween time. So it's nice to have hot chocolate, but uh, you're not allowed to do that kind of stuff anymore, right? I mean, it People was just... People burned this old woman's house to the ground. <laughs> it was just so weird because... She goes up, and she was all excited, and, and she's like, look, Daddy, I got hot chocolate. And I was sitting there thinking, man, should I let her drink that? Is, I mean, do I need to be freaked out as a parent because this person is giving away something that they made, and maybe it's full of bourbon or full of strychnine or I don't know what it's full of, but do I need to freak out about this? Because it's not allowed to do that anymore. There, there's razor blades in the hot chocolate. That's so weird that somebody would do that still. I mean... In this day and age. Yeah, in this day and age, you're not allowed to give out something you made yourself. Even if you're a 75-year-old lady with white hair and you know that you can't do harm to anyone or whatever. Still, you're not allowed to do that. And what was worse was, <laughs> daughter goes, oh, dad, look, I got some hot chocolate. And she walked forward and fell off of their freaking porch. <laughs> dumped the hot chocolate all over herself and scratched her leg or something. I think the people that were at the house went inside and like got a band-aid for her to put on her leg and stuff like that. Oh, I thought you know they went inside and gave each other high fives. <laughs> that was their intention. That's what they did while they were getting the band-aids. But, but yeah, and she had to go <laughs> the whole rest of the way trick-or-treating covered in wet hot chocolate. And she was wearing a white rabbit costume that year too, so it uh, didn't really improve the look of the costume. It made her a palomino rabbit is that such a thing palomino is a brown and white horse but it does just brown and white doesn't mean palomino does it could there be a palomino cow i don't know but um oh, see i i don't have any kids because you're gay well no, it's not because i'm gay it just everybody's <laughs> a little bit gay pulling out the year one jokes <laughs> <laughs> i've gone trick-or-treating with my nephew you know, I, I, I don't know. The, it gets cold, and so it's kind of unpleasant and all that. And you, I, I didn't grow up in California like you do, so I, you'd always see shows like E.T., and, and, and it's still sunny and warm and beautiful. And Kids are going out trick-or-treating in, like, bikinis. and Yeah, and to me that's, that was always Wearing really, those, those genie harem girl outfits. Yeah, because it's cold for Halloween here, your kid would be miserable with hot chocolate all over so. Not, not that kids would delight in having hot chocolate all over themselves on a normal day. Well, California kids might, you know. There you go. For some reason, it seems like it's nice all the way until like a week or two before Halloween. And then all of a sudden, boom, snow falls and the temperature drops like 50 degrees or something. And it's just miserable. I remember one year 
we had to put the kids in their snow suits to go uh, trick or treating. And like my son had a Superman costume that year, and the suit underneath the Superman costume, it looked so awful. He looked like he had like elephantitis or something. His leg was just like really fat, and and he had to wear like a stocking cap on his head, which kind of doesn't really match so well with Superman's spit curl. That's so weird to me. I, because I don't have kids, I you know I, I never considered that kind of thing, and and I've never thought about having to go through the candy looking for you know the evil candies, like the Tootsie Rolls and the butterscotches and those little cinnamon ones that are wrapped in the red. Oh, you foil. hate cinnamon, don't you? Oh boy, do I hate cinnamon That's candy. Weird. Ugh. I love cinnamon. Anyhow, uh, you don't like chocolate, though. You are as food bar as can be. Even so, it's against my nature to throw away food or throw away candy. You know, if I had to toss candy, off especially a, a caramel apple or when I, oh, it would just be so difficult. When I, when I was in kindergarten, you know, I would walk to and from school, and that's unheard of today too it's for a five-year-old to do that but but oh well unless they live exactly across the street and their mother's standing on the porch watching them go yeah it was just a different time and i remember there was an old man that lived about about two blocks from the school and two blocks from my house like midway there and he would hand out candy you know he was this kindly old man that every kindergarten kid knew about and we would all go past his house on the way home and he would be there waiting for us you know just this lonely old dude giving us candy and you know back then that was just you know oh, what a nice old man you know he must be lonely it's neat for him to see the delight on our little faces when he gives us the candy but today that would be suspicious it would be like well this twisted sack of shit you know what I mean? <laughs> He'd be getting online and checking to see if he's a sex offender. Uh, you wouldn't even check. You would just assume yeah. that he Don't was. Don't you dare go by that man's house and take candy from him. Show me on this doll where he touched you. You know, just <laughs> one of those things. There was actually a lady like that was like that here in my neighborhood for a while. An old in lady. In modern times? Yeah. I think everybody just called her the candy lady or something like that. And my kids would go and play at these, these other kids' house. And she lived right across the street from them. Would give them candy and molest them and stuff. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I wasn't paying attention. What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I was just about to say it's too bad you can't be generous in that way today like you could then. But obviously it still goes on if you had a candy lady in, yeah. in your town in the 21st century. Well, it's funny because I was suspicious of this person. You know, you, you kind of have to be in this day and age. You're just like, what is the deal with this candy lady? What is she getting out of it? Like the author was saying in her author's note, you know. They love having people come over. What evil thing are they drawing from it? Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's too bad that we live in a time where a person can't just be generous in that way. I mean, the people can still be generous. They have to find other ways to do it. And, and you know, I, whenever I just mentioned seeing people trick-or-treat during the day, that's totally alien and completely effed up to me. <laughs> But I guess I understand why it's done because you don't want your kid out there dressed as Darth Vader or a ninja or Shaft or something <laughs> at night, you know, where there are cars driving around and open manhole covers and clown spider aliens in the sewers and, you know, strangers. Back in our day, there weren't clown spider aliens that you had to worry about. But nowadays, they pop up all over. The, you know, yeah, it's much bigger. We concern. need to close the borders, frankly. <laughs> Vote for me in November. Anyhow, I, I, I know this story isn't about trick-or-treating, but, but I, I can't help but think about it. You know, just the, 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 the kids going to a house. And, I, you know, I, I may never be able to understand fully your point of view or the, the point of view of a parent. This is a small community that you live in with the coyotes just right there next door. Don't you know everybody in, in the neighborhood? Not really. I mean, I know a lot of people in the neighborhood, but I don't. I don't even know, like, my neighbors, like, on either side. I don't know their names or anything like that. Well, that's so weird. I, one time I came over here to record, and there was this little kid in your yard, and he was, I think he was smearing animal shite on your door, <laughs> or he was pounding nails in the tires of your cars, or he was he was sawing off your tree limbs. He wasn't sawing off the tree limbs. He was just hanging on them and pulling down. He actually did remove many of the well i didn't remove the limbs but he broke the limbs from the trees in front of our house to the point where i 
really dislike this child. I've had to go out there and saw off the limbs that he broke. And now our tree, which used to be, I mean, we had actually two of the nicest trees in our neighborhood out in front of our house. The, the city came through and planted in like the park strip or whatever it is, the place in between the sidewalk, the sidewalk and the street, there's that little strip of grass, and they planted a tree every 30, 40 feet, something like that, all the way down the street. And they're all the same trees. And ours were the nicest ones in the neighborhood. They were green and full and nice, and there was other people's who were, the top of it was dead, or they were going brown, like, by July and instead of in October when leaves actually turn colors. And, you know, we were kind of proud of them. We liked it. They but were the no nicest more. trees. And this kid broke several of the branches and now it's all crooked and one side is off center from the other side and it's not a pretty tree anymore and i'm really because of somebody else's kid yeah i don't know why he wouldn't do it to the stupid tree in front of his own house instead of doing it to our tree um and there's actually one tree which is really close to the edge of the property of both of our houses he left that one alone and came all the way over to the one that's way in front of our house and broke all the branches on that one. He does all sorts of crap, too. Doorbell ditches our house and all sorts of stuff. And my wife's had to yell at him. And, uh, yeah, I've come out and seen him with, like, a piece of metal or knife or I don't know what he had exactly. I wouldn't think he would have a knife. But scraping on the bark of the tree. And I'm just like, don't you touch my tree. And he's he's going to be going after your daughters, you really. <laughs> You're going to have yeah. to have the talk with them. It's trouble. <clears throat> wow, this is so weird. You know, I, I live with my sister and brother-in-law, and they're two kids now. And so I see children and, and tend the children all every, you know every single day. You see dead people? They don't even know that they're dead? No, they're walking around. They, they I can't remember what he says. <laughs> it's a movie I need to see again. I loved that movie. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, sorry, tangent. Uh, but I spend a great deal of time with my nephew, uh -huh. um, the three-year-old, and sometimes I'll take him with me when I, you know, go places. Like I, I and I, I the, all of these things that I'm having to learn that I wouldn't normally learn without a kid around. But like, like one of the things that is this whole car seat mentality. It's not okay for the kid to sit on the seat with a seatbelt on. And it's not okay for him to just to sit in the car seat. You have to strap him in like it's a bloody Six Flags ride. And it snaps <laughs> up here in the center and then down by the crotch. You have to fiddle around and the, the, the straps are never bar. long enough. You have to bring yeah. that bar over. Yeah. You have to have them sign a waiver, <laughs> you know. And in the summer, I liked to take him when I would go to garage sales. That was something I enjoyed doing. And, and you have to strap him into this contraption and then you stop just to look and see what they have. And you have to unstrap him and get him out. Oh, no, they don't have anything. They just have clothes here. Get back in the car. Go through the whole ordeal again. I just don't get that. I mean, well, I understand, I guess, that you can't just stick him in the car or, you know, you stay in the car while I go get food in the grocery store or whatever or have him go return a video for him because he's three. For example, just this last week, I took him to Del Taco. How dare you? Yeah, I'm a... What kind of a person are you? took the kid to Del Taco? Well, there are reasons I have no children. But, you know, there are two Del Tacos, and one of them has a Playland, and then one of them doesn't. And we always go to the one that doesn't, because I found that if you take them and they go into this contraption, this... Uh, I mean, it's like a giant hamster habitrail kind <laughs> right. of thing. Okay, but I found that if, if once they're in there... There's no incentive to ever come out. You know what I mean? It's just like, hey, I'm having fun. If I come out, he's going to take me home. <laughs> but if he stays up there forever, <laughs> I have to do these bargains with him about if you eat your food, then you can go in. Anyhow, uh, I'm, I'm making this story much bigger than it is. That's but your way. I guess <laughs> so. But, but we wouldn't have a show if I didn't. That's right. It'd be a, yet another 15-minute Toon Steve episode. Yet another. So I took him into the Playland, and I set him down on the chair, and I went and ordered. And even that, I probably was a, a, a bad adult. You're not supposed to leave him there or whatever at the seat. But, you know, there's this giant glass enclosure where the Playland is. You wow, know? it really it's not is like a hamster habitat. And, you know, McDonald's has them. You know, there's a section where the kids are indoors, and it has a door. 
And I went and I ordered, and I think it was because Real Steel had just come out, they were giving away balloons. And the, the, the cashier wouldn't give me a balloon. And I was just like, well, I, I have a kid. Come on. And, and I guess the deal was the kid has to accept the balloon. And so she was a douche to you and said, no, you can't have a balloon. <laughs> well, it's, it's fine. But it would be fine if an adult said, I have a kid. Or even if I don't have a kid, I'm a child inside. I want a balloon. <laughs> I am a paying customer. I just bought a burrito. Give me the damn balloon. <laughs> Anyhow, I had to go back to the playland to get him so that he could be given a balloon. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with that. If the cashier or whatever likes to see the delight in the eyes of the children when they're given balloons, it's akin to 50 years ago, that old man giving out candy. So I went back into the glass enclosure. And as we started to come out, there was a child outside of the glass enclosure pressed up against the glass. Two maybe years old, young enough that she was wearing no pants and had a diaper on, which a dude, that's a, a restaurant. Uh, and two, but just like a really ugly, feral, uh, fat, <laughs> dirty, ginger kid. Oh my. Ah. Yeah. Just trying to get in, pressed up against the glass. Gingers don't have souls. There is truth to this. <laughs> and my nephew, the three-year-old, opened the door for her and she bit him. Didn't say anything. It was like fucking Dawn of the Dead. <laughs> the second he opened the door, she didn't want to get into the playland. She wanted him. <laughs> <laughs> so how long did it take for your nephew to turn and you had to... Oh, well, we, we went by the gun store on the way home. <laughs> I said, he's my dog, mama. I'll do it. <laughs> Okay, so so I separated my nephew from this child, the feral child, and the kid's grandmother or mother or, or whatever, she stood there, and I expected a comment from, about it or an apology, you know, but there was nothing. She said nothing. And so much louder than necessary, I said, <laughs> did she just bite you? You know, like, that loud. So there would be no mistaking my outrage. And the woman did nothing. She didn't censor a kid. She didn't ask if my kid was okay. I was just incensed. But I, I wanted to say, hey, if my kid had just bitten your kid, I'd be apologizing right now because that's what you do. Um, luckily, he'd gotten a tetanus shot or he'd gotten that H1N1. Flu booster? I, no, thing? I think that's a video game SARS console. Shot? They don't have a SARS shot. That just kind of went away. What's, what's the deal with that? I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm sure I don't know. You know, they, they just I was so outraged that it was okay with this woman what had just happened. You know, I, I used to see it all the time in L.A. There was this time I was standing in line at Burger King and this little snot-nosed kid ran up and head-butted me in the nuts. And it was just like, whoa, ho, ho, whoa, kind of thing. And the kid looked at me, and there, the expression on his face was unmistakable. It was, what are you going to do about it? And the kid's parents were in line with me. They saw it happen, and they said nothing. They did nothing. How is that conscionable? How is that excusable? I, I used to see it all the time, but that was the worst, most egregious example because, well, they were my nuts, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. It's, you know, you've got to be a parent. I mean, I think that's one of the big problems that is happening in this world is that people just won't be parents to their children. They want to be their buddies or... But, but this kid that runs into a stranger, a total stranger, an adult, and doesn't apologize and, and thinks that he can get away with it because what are you going to do? Five years from now, that kid is going to be stealing your car. And six years from now, he's going to be raping your girlfriend or three maybe. You know, it starts from a little kid throwing in a tantrum in a public place and the parents just let it happen or they pretend that it is not happening. And, you know, I feel like because I don't have kids, I'm not in a position to say this. You know, it's like, well, you don't know what it's like to be a black man in America. You can't talk about that, you know, or, or you don't know what it's like to be the one pretty girl in a school where nobody is hot. <laughs> It's common sense. When you see something like that, it's so ugly. And you know that it's just going to go on from there. You know, you've got to be a parent if you're going to be a parent. I mean, if you've got a kid, you need to do the things that are necessary to raise it. 
to help this child of yours to grow up to not be a monster. Because, yeah, someday it will be the one stealing your car. you got to stop texting for just a minute and actually pay attention to your child when it's playing on the playground going, Hey, Mommy, look at me. Look at him. And say, Yes, great. Good job. Instead of just, Oh, yeah, uh-huh, I'm, I'm, I'm texting here. Sorry, but I can't bother to Mommy, look, look up. Me. Mommy, look uh. at me hot wiring this car. <laughs> and then that's the worst part, I think. Is that what you said about that kid at the Burger King? You know, he looks at you and he's like, what are you going to do about it? Dude, I felt so helpless and frustrated and furious and impotent. It just, that was a horrible feeling and I've never forgotten it. It should have been one of those things where you're like, eh, you, you, you get behind it. But just the look on this kid's face of, oh yeah? What, you know, it was like, a, it was like a, a bully in <laughs> high school saying, oh, you're going to cry now kind of thing. Only it's from a little kid. Yeah, kids know these days that you can't do anything about it what would you do what are you going to slap that kid and say what the hell are you doing you just hit me in the nuts what's wrong with you you can't do that second you did that then his parents would suddenly be outraged and they would get all in your face about you actually trying to discipline their child for them which of course they weren't doing you know they'll be all upset and they'd take you to court and they'd bring you up on charges you know there's this kid just the other day there was a news story about this guy who was a PE teacher or something like that and he's been one for 20 years and there was some douchebag kid in his classroom who started acting up and causing problems and this guy actually you know he got in this kid's face and tried to discipline him and what happened to him what do you think he lost his job he was when? brought up on charges, and because he's brought up on charges, he's lost his job. He can't be a teacher if he's... I, I think he had to plead no contest to it or something like that, which screws him. He's been a teacher for 20 years, and now he's gone. Forget after-school snacks. That is a horror story. <laughs> okay, I just... I, I grew up in a different time. We were in a farming community, and my, like our second grade teacher, he would slap my hand. He would pull my hair. He would... Molest uh, you? Well, just just the one time. In our school, it was allowed once. <laughs> you know, but my mom and dad knew that the teacher would discipline us in this way. And my mom was like, well, he's just an old-fashioned teacher. He comes from another time. And if I told my dad about it, he'd, he'd want to shake the teacher's hand. And slap you. Yeah, this is for not being born a boy. <laughs> Smack! <laughs> Wait, what? I, if any of what was done to me in the third grade were done today, that teacher... They would be done. And, you know, I hate to sound like an old fart. But I, I sound like one, right? But times were you different. You fart know? already, so maybe that's uh, why. So that's my way. Cue the hate mail. I felt like a parent <laughs> when my, my boy was bitten. Anyhow, we told that story at Sunday dinner or whatever. And he, like, showed where he got bit and all that stuff. And he became center of attention. And, and I think there was a positive spin because everybody's like, oh, my gosh, really? And so everybody said, oh, my gosh, look, I think it's getting gangrenous. You don't know cute until you've heard a three-year-old <laughs> say brains. <laughs> it's, it's weird. I hear myself telling these stories. And if I had a kid, I would be telling it to them about how life was different then or how we had to <laughs> right. walk to school in kindergarten and all that stuff. You know, we're not boasting. We're just talking about how the way we suffered then strengthened us or made us into who made me into the man child sitting before you today <laughs> it's just you know like this is how easy you have it and maybe we want them to appreciate that look sure <laughs> <laughs> exactly and no kid is ever going to appreciate how well they have it it's not until you're older and you see a that somebody has it better than you or b that somebody has a heck of a lot worse than you. you know? But but all that the, the we suffered toughened us up, you know? That's right. It's like Jonathan Colton says in that one song, I think it's I think it's Madeline, where he says, if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. But if it kills you, you'll be dead. All right. Well hey, let's let's <laughs> end on that note. That was good. I, I know we were all over the place, but it was kind of hard. This was we were recording a rerun today. <laughs> but thank you, Ms. Black. For Kay Bowen Black. Little boy Black. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Bowen Black, for sending in the story. And thank you, Scott, for producing this story. Right. And thanks, everybody, who did voices in the show. 
Um, and, and for listening to the end of the show. That's what yes, I always Yes, there's say. a good one. Thanks uh, to the listeners for actually tuning in. Do you tune in to a podcast? There's no tuning involved, is there? I don't know, but whatever they did, thank you for doing it. Yes, thanks for doing something. Right, now is the time on Sprockish when we dance. No, now's the time when I should be asking for donations. Let me just take a deep breath and see if I can do it. <clears throat> we paid Ms. Bowen Black for her story. This was her first sale, right? All right. And apparently money can be traded for goods and services. Uh, now, we didn't pay her enough for goods and services. It'd have to be either or. But the money we paid her came from donations, from, from people who like the show and have kindly pressed the button and uh, given us a, a little bit of money to kick around to buy stories with. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you are one of those people if you, that, that like the show and you want to encourage us to put them out more often, please donate. Uh, I, you know, I hate asking it's so weird. It doesn't get easier with time. It's like you were saying with just doing the show over and over, get easier and faster. Uh -huh. This doesn't get easier. I, 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 okay, maybe if I asked for donations every single day for a month, uh -huh. it, it would become a habit and I could uh, naturally do it like everybody on other there shows. There you go. Now. Yeah, you just spit out the same rote thing that you've said every time. Ooh, that's what people like. Yes, they do. I will work on That will be my goal for this month, okay? There you go. Please donate, and thanks for listening. Good night. Good night, folks. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. From the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine, so long and thanks for all the fish. Take two. Okay, ready to start. I need to adjust my crotch too real fast. Oh, it's better. Okay, let's try this again. I actually pressed record this time, which I think will improve the quality of the recording. Or just improve the fact that it is recording. <sighs> I hate doing things second time. It's so frustrating. Oh, maybe I'll be able to read it faster, though, because of it. <clears throat> she had watched the little boy grow more and more. <laughs> I guess it's not going to help me that I just read this because of making the same mistakes as I did last time. The woman put down her fork and knife and balled her hands into anguished fists. Please tell me what's wrong, Richard. Or, as I like to call you, Little Dick. Her waivers are all right, he said. But no one makes nectar like you do. <laughs> did that as long as I could, but I ran out of breath. I guess this is not at all related to the story, but just the, 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 the evil children thing. I never tire of <laughs> stories about evil children, but real life evil children I can do without. There you go. I think most anyone can do without that. Yeah. Do you can, can you share a, an experience, a story, uh, just of of either your kid being a fuck up or uh, seeing other children, you know, little bestial bastards? How how do you prevent your kid from being one of those? Ripping branches off their neighbor's trees and making their neighbors really angry. So, uh, yeah, we've got a script that we're going to try and keep to. We're going to hold to this script. A announcer man is going to be our script supervisor during the show. I'm just an announcer. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, he's going to make sure if we, if we veer off the script, he's going to make sure that, you know, number 89 hasn't turned into a white guy or whatever. 
chocolate chip cookie recipe that used all the ingredients that you enjoy. It did because it's got like evil old woman. It's got little crap. No, not well. Not which. Which. <laughs> so weird. Have you ever done an old woman voice on one of our episodes? Or do I always hog those? Uh, I think you pretty much hog those. I usually I do old man voices here and there, but yeah, I've used that one a few times. I've never done the old lady one. Okay, I, I want to hear you say, yeah, I've used that one a, whole t- a, a few times as Bill Clinton and see if it sounds exactly the same. <laughs> For years and years and years. So it was like... Again, sometimes we say it's like a, sh- a story that was made for, what is it? The pot, the pot I, was I was born, born to, to play. play. It was, a st- it just was up my alley. It was up my cup of, of Earl Grey. And so, yeah, I just, I couldn't help but eat it up. I, I was an easy mark. Yeah, it's like they saw you coming down the street and they said, oh, quick, quick. There he is again. Get back into the alley. He got another Xbox to replace the one we stole. <laughs> Uh, wow. Oh, well, we're starting to repeat ourselves. There you go. Anyway, uh, we, like last week when we did the giving birth episode, I, I, you know, I still want to know how that, that regenerating sound was made, you know. But some people it's don't still- want to know. Some people are, hey, I, you know, don't. A magician never reveals his tricks. You know, yeah, they, so they, they don't want to know how that noise is made. Most people just want the noise to stop. They're just sitting there squirming and eh, their shoulders are. Oh. oh, I'm sorry. Screw you guys. I'm going home. Well, I, that's. Just... Yeah, wow. That's, uh, that's pretty harsh. Okay, well then, now that he's out of the room, let's talk about him. <laughs> How old and shriveled is his scrotum? Oh, gosh. Uh, so anyhow... Another image in my mind that I would like to not have to have, would you please? Stop the farting. I cannot help myself. Every... Ooh, you farted. You farted, Terrence. <laughs> Can't do that here where there's snow on the ground. Yeah, one year it was so here and... And you had to cut open a tauntaun to... (laughs) Oh my goodness, the Superman costume that my son was wearing. What is it? He looks like Superman's got elephantitis or whatever. I mean, his legs were so fat from the snowsuit. It just looked awful, totally wrong. And, And he had like a beanie pulled on over his ears and everything like that. And it's like, boy, these costumes sure aren't cool this way. Stay. Bark, bark, wagtail. Good boy. Good boy.